to Memorial Park Baptist Church. If you've been following us these past couple weeks, you know that we're in the book of Nehemiah and we have been marching along one chapter after another as a means for us to think about how, what we can do and how can we do, do it in terms of reviving the church after the pandemic. And we're going to start today, we're up to chapter 10. But I wanted to ask you if any of you have ever heard or maybe have visited the Bithmore Mansion in Asheville, North Carolina. It was built at the day, at the time that it was built. It was the biggest, most elaborate house in all of the United States. In fact, it was so big and so elaborate that even the Vanderbilts could not continue to pay to maintain it because it costs so much. You know, we know that uh, back in that time era that there were many well-known men, the Rockefellers, Carnegie, uh, the Vanderbilts, families that became almost overnight immensely wealthy off of the railroads and, and all the other things that was going on at that time. And they just seemed to be driven to get more and more and more. Whatever they had just didn't seem to be enough. They had to amass even more fortunes. And yet, at the end of their lives, what did they do? They gave away most of their fortune. And why? Because they realized they couldn't take it with them. It was unfortunate that it took them that length of time at, on their deathbed or right before they died to realize their money wasn't going to go with them. It wasn't going to help them in any way. And so they gave it away um, in the end. And so I think what begs the question today is what are we committed to? They were committed to making money. What are we committed to? You know, chapter 10 in Nehemiah, the people finally got it right. Let me just review for you very quickly in chapter 8. The people heard the word of God for the first time in many, many, many years. Their reaction was one of praise and then also one of repentance when they realized that they had not been following the law of God. And then chapter 9, they made the decision to turn their lives around. And in chapter 10, which we're going to look at today, they made a commitment to put God first. Now, the key verses, I think, in chapter 10 are verses 28, 29, and the tail end of verse 39. So I'd like to read them for you at this time. Starting at verse 28, the rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand. All these now join their brothers and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an earth, an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully, I love that word, carefully, all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our Lord. The very end of 39 simply says, we will not neglect the house of our God. And so what was this commitment all about? The commitment was 
that they were going to follow the law, carefully follow the law and obey it. And secondly, they were not going to neglect the house of God. So in a nutshell, they were putting God first in their lives. But what were they really committing to? Somebody asked me earlier this week, we were uh, doing a lesson and I, the term measurable objectives came up and the person was kind of wondering, well, what's a, they knew what an objective was, but what was a measurable objective? And I explained it was something that you could know if that objective was met. You could know if you said, I'm going to make a commitment to be in church this year, every Sunday that I can. And at the end of the year, you look and you say, I've been in church 46 out of 52 Sundays. So you know where you stood with that objective. You know, you didn't meet it exactly. You weren't there every Sunday, but you were pretty darn close. And that's what it means by a measurable objective. And the people here, they didn't just make that global commitment and say, we're going to obey God's laws carefully and we're not going to neglect God's house. What does that really mean? Well, chapter, starting at verse 30 on, we read some of the measurable things that they were making a commitment to, to show that they were putting God first. And they were things that you could easily look at and say, you are or you are not. Take, for example, verse 30. Verse 30 says, we promise not to give our daughters in marriages to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. What are they saying? They're saying they're going to put God first before their love life. Why? Well, I think they had learned, as sometimes we learn the hard way, that when a believer and an unbeliever comes together in marriage, you don't have them on the same page. You really don't. And oftentimes the believer has this idea in his or her head that they'll be the one to lead their spouse to the Lord. And yet down through the ages, we find that that usually does not happen. One reason is that you can't change somebody else. You can't force your beliefs on somebody else. They have to take it for themselves. It's a free gift of salvation, but they've got to take it. We can't take it for them. And it doesn't work. It usually doesn't work. And even worse than that, that a lot of times the unbelieving spouse actually leads the believer away. Who's an example of that? A prime example? Look at King Solomon. He married so many foreign wives who were not aligned with the law of God and they took him away from God. So let's not fall into that trap. If Satan is whispering, you know, into your ear, it's okay to be with an unbeliever. That's a lie. It's not okay. And here, the people of, the, of Israel, the Israelites, were saying, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to put God first, even in our love lives. And then verse 31, they went on to say, when the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Wow. I guess they had been conducting business on the Sabbath. And now they had heard through the word of God that the Sabbath is to be kept holy. That is the day you do not work. That is the day you do not conduct business. No matter how pressing it might be, no matter how, uh, what a great opportunity it might be to meet somebody, to discuss, or they're bringing something that you really want and it may not be there when the Sabbath is over. And yet the people are saying, you know what? We are going to follow God's law. We're going to put him first. We're going to keep the Sabbath holy. And we are not going to conduct business on Sunday. And then they went on to say, every seventh year, we will forego working the land and will cancel all debts. Every seven years. Cancel all debts. They weren't looking to get rich off of somebody who was less fortunate than they were. That's what they had been doing. 
But they read in God's word that that was not to be the case, that every seven years, some of these things are coming out of the five books of the law, the Torah, that every seven years, you need to forgive the debt and start all over again. What mercy that God has given to us as he forgives our debts. And he's telling us, you know, when money is concerned, let it go. Let it go. That's not the most important thing in life. But you know what? We have to realize that money does control a lot of things, don't we? We know that. And we know that money, it's, it's not money itself that is the root of all evil. That verse is misquoted all the time. It is what we do with the money. It's how we think about the money. It's does it consume us? Or do we use it for God's glory? That's really the important matter, not how much it is. I want to take you back to Matthew uh, chapter 6 and verse 19. This is Jesus speaking, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he has to say. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Why? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Something to think about. The Israelites were saying, we are going to put God first before money, before opportunities. But then they went on to say, in verse 32 and 33, they were talking about that not only were they not going to make money on the Sabbath, but they were going to give more than they had before. We're going to assume the responsibilities of carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our Lord. And then they, they go on down to say, we, the priests, the Levites, and the people have cast lots to determine when each of our families is to bring to the house of our God at set times each year a contribution of wood on the, uh, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. Wow. This is kind of like a double whammy. First, they're going to lose one day out of seven where they're not going to be doing anything with money. And then second, so they're going to have less money. And second, they're going to give some of it away. And they're going to give it to God's house. You know, wood back in those days was very expensive. They didn't have the chainsaws that we have today to cut the trees down. They didn't have the tractor trailers to haul the logs where they needed to be. And yet there were a lot of offerings that were offered in God's house that required wood. You know, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings. There were a number of offerings that had to be offered according to uh, the book of the law in those days. And wood was expensive. And yet the people were saying, you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to make God first. And then they went on to say, because God is more important than things and money, they're going to bring God the first fruits of their labor. They're going to give him what's first, not the leftovers. I think there's a lesson here for us. In verse 35, it says about that they're going to bring uh, to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crop and of every fruit tree. And then verses 36 and 37 identifies what those first fruits were. That requires commitment. That requires a strong commitment. And it's very easy to measure. Did they or didn't they? You know, I think that in this day and age, we uh, have problems with money because we are fed over the TV, social, uh, networking, how other people live, that money, we have to have more and more and more of it to be considered successful. Well, God doesn't count success like the world counts success. And he sees many, many poor people 
much more successful than the richest man in the world probably because their heart is in God not on something else such as money and so they were not going to allow worry anxiety greed fear to control their lives anymore they were going to put their hands they were going to put their lives into God's hands and let him take care of them Psalm 23 1 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not be in need or in the King James I shall not want he will take care of us but we need to remember where he is in the priorities of our lives is he first and foremost in our lives when we do our budget is he the last thing that we consider or is he the first now don't get me wrong you got to pay your bills it is not a good witness to anyone if you give to the church or give to God and and you don't pay your bills you got to pay your bills as part of being financially responsible as part of our witness uh, of being people of God but I have to ask you where is God in your budget and I know some people say you know the Old Testament is 10 percent and you see that in verses 37 38 they talk about offerings they talk about tithes and and how that's going to be done but and I got to tell you that I think the New Testament command to give as you feel led to to give what's on your heart is a whole lot harder and probably more than 10 percent in the Old Testament God is saying I gave you everything 100 percent is because of me you can have 90 percent all I want is 10 I think that's a fair deal but in the New Testament as we just read in Matthew you know that very last verse you know for where your treasure is there your heart will be also where is our heart today is it on the things of God or is it on trying to keep pace with our neighbors we need to be careful what the Israelites were saying God is far more important than their wants not their needs but their wants and in verse 39 I love this at the very end we will not neglect the house of our God of course it could be referring to financial things obviously the church cannot run unless we pay our electric bill our Wi-Fi bill we have need to have janitors to clean the bathrooms and, and and keep the house in order we need repairs we just had a brand new roof put on our sanctuary for thousands and thousands of dollars but we needed to do that because we were facing uh, any moment now and especially after the storm on Thursday I just kept thinking or Wednesday night I kept thinking how God blessed us that roof was finished on Monday <laughs> and then we had this horrible storm Wednesday night and we were of course were without power until Friday and and I'm sure some of you were too and it was a tremendous storm trees all over the place power lines down microbursts uh, it was just really the worst that I've ever seen in this area and yet part of it I think here when we say we will not neglect the house of our God certainly is financial but I think there's another piece to that that we will not neglect the house of our God and I think it also means we will not neglect coming to the house of God to worship we will not neglect that God's house is there I know I know there are people that say I don't need to be in a special building to worship God and that's true I can worship God out in the woods that's true but have you ever noticed the people that say that do not go out into the woods to worship God it's a cop-out you know they're just using it to to get you off their back maybe because they don't want to do it if they really wanted to do it and let me tell you I believe when they would get out in the woods and they do that on a regular basis to worship God I think sooner or later they would be coming into church to worship as they read God's Word you know Hebrews uh, tells us that we are not to forsake the gathering together of ourselves on the Sabbath and and it is because 
we are to be there for each other, to encourage one another. We can't encourage anyone if we're out alone in the woods. It's a very important piece of not neglecting God's house. And then, and, and there's a reason for that. You know, if I turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, we've got this warning here that we need to listen to. And it says in, in verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. You need to be in the presence of God. He is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And I believe one of the ways that he provides for us is to have others around us to encourage us to keep going. Even if we've made a mistake, even if we've kind of gotten off track, they'll help us to get back on track and keep going forward. There's a warning there. Don't ever think any one of us can fall at any time if we are not firmly entrenched in the Word of God. God gave us seven days for ourselves. He asked for only one to keep the Sabbath holy. One out of seven, that's not a bad deal, I don't think. And even one hour out of the seven days of 24 hours apiece, one hour to give to worship him, I don't think that's too much to ask. It is a sacrifice to get up. It is a sacrifice to get dressed, to get your breakfast early, to get to church, and, and then get home again. And maybe lunch will be delayed because you were at church. But it's a sacrifice well worth taking. God will bless you. I, I cannot tell you except to reassure you because I know from personal experience, if you honor God with your time, you take the time to worship him, you give to him the first fruits of your labor, you're going to have story after story after story to tell. I'm not preaching the pros prosperous gospel. I'm not saying if you ask for a red Cadillac, he's going to give you a red Cadillac. That's not what I'm saying. But I know that God wants to give us good gifts. And when he is pleased with us, he gives us many good gifts. And he will if we put him first. You know, the Emperor Cortez, or the Explorer, he wasn't the Emperor, excuse me. The Explorer Cortez, he brought 500 men to Mexico to explore that region. He made many mistakes, many, but there was one thing that he did that was very wise. When they got there to Mexico, the land that we know Mexico today, he burned the ships. Those 500 men had to be committed now because there was no turning back. And that's what we need to be. We need to be committed to the word of God. Haven't all of this come about? Because in chapter 8, they heard the word of God. They were listening to what God had to say. And I would like to challenge you today to just start reading God's word. Devotionals are wonderful. I love devotionals. They always bring out some interesting things that I would never have thought of. But that should not take the place of reading God's word. What they're writing about is the experience they had when they read God's word. But what has been your experience? What has been mine? You need to read it for yourself. Make it a habit and see how it will change your life as it changed the Israelites. If you have never made a full commitment, a hundred percent commitment to Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do so today. He is waiting, willing to accept you, willing to forgive you, willing to bring you into the fold, to love on you and to nurture you and to encourage you and to support you and, and show you grace and mercy and all the wonderful things that God has promised in his word. All you have to do is to turn to Jesus. 
Admit that you need him. The people of Israel were not doing well without God's help. And they knew that. As soon as they read God, as soon as they heard God's word read to them, they knew they hadn't been following it. They knew where the source of many of their troubles were coming from. And they made a commitment to stand firm, give their lives 100% to God. He doesn't want 80 or 90%. He wants 100%. I encourage you to do that today. You will have an amazing life down the road if you do. All you have to do is come to Jesus. Confess your sins and acknowledge him to be your Lord and Savior. But maybe you've done that and you've fallen away. You've shifted and you're thinking, well, I, I can never go back to church. I, you know, I've done all these things and um, I'm not really very faithful and so I don't belong in church. You know what? That's a bunch of baloney. That's Satan again talking to you. God doesn't want to lose anyone. He wants us all to be part of his family. And, you know, we need to be careful, those of us who have made a profession of faith, about falling away. Because listen to what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3. He said, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Why did he say that? We often misinterpret this because we think cold means the opposite of, of hot, and it does, but not in the way that Jesus was talking about it here. You see, there were cold springs back in those days in Laodicea that you could go that would help heal you. And there were also hot springs. They both were used for the same thing. What Jesus was saying is, here he says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. He doesn't want lukewarm Christians. He doesn't. He wants us on fire for him. He wants us committed to him. The question today is, are we? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the guidance that gives us in that word. We thank you for the uh, way in which you are portrayed in your word so that we know that you are trustworthy, that you are faithful, that you are loving, that you are full of grace and mercy, and that you are willing to accept us right where we are today. But you love us enough not to leave us where we are today, but you want to raise us up even further. And so, Father, I just pray today that as the Israelites made these commitments to you, may we do likewise to show our love and gratitude to you, Jesus, for you gave your all for us. In Jesus' name, amen.